<laughs> All right. It is going to be great. So today I'm going to talk about the political lives of undocumented Latino youth. And there's my official Menlo College seal. So um, there are approximately 5 million undocumented youth in this country, uh, many of them Latino. And there are several things uh, that might come to mind about that. Like, why are there 5 million undocumented youth in this country, right? Are they crossing the border to steal kindergarten? Like, what is going on that's creating this issue um, of, of these youth, right? What's happening is that we have policies in place, both foreign and domestic, that in incentivize people to come here to work, right? Um, we have a ridiculously low caps on the number of, of visas that are allowed, um, and so it's very difficult to come here and work legally. Um, demand for workers is very high, and the program that was signed by Reagan in 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, really gives people an incentive to come to obtain false documents or get somebody else's social security number and work. There's no <coughs> sanctions on employers. All the punishment is to the employee. Um, so there's a lot of jobs here that need to be filled. And because it's very difficult to come legally on a worker visa or um, through the system legally, uh, people evade the system. They either come here um, illegally, sneak across the border, or come on a student visa or a tourist visa and just stay. Um, but then our borders are super tight now, much tighter than they used to be, particularly since the 1986 IRCA. And so, whereas it used to be that we had patterns of circular migration, people would come here to work, go home, see their families, come back here and work, right, and go back and forth. Now, it's too dangerous and too expensive to keep crossing. And so it's better to just stay here. But these are human beings. They're not just automatons. They're not just robots that come here and work in our construction industries and in our agribusiness and, um, and in our hotels. Um, they're human beings. They have spouses. They have families. And so they bring them here, right? So it's logical, right? Um, you're here because <coughs> staying in your own country often means starving or letting your children starve. There are jobs here, and it's pretty easy to evade the rules and work with false documents or under the table. And then you bring your family here to be with you. And so it's really very logical that there are so many um, undocumented children here. And um, as long as those incentive systems persist, as long as the structure is still there, which incentivizes people to come here and then stay here, we'll continue to have the problem. So making the border tighter won't do anything, right? Um, because the, there's so much of the U.S. economy that is dependent upon this low-cost, exploitable labor. There's no political will to crack down on it. Um, we as consumers enjoy the low prices and the high standard of living that comes as a result of all of these undocumented workers. Um, so there are these millions and millions of children here. And they grow up thinking that they are American, right? So if you're this little cute undocumented kid, you get brought here by the grown-ups in your life when you're a toddler or a baby, a small child. Well, you guys are smart. W. Madison <coughs> students, why would you not tell your three-year-old that they are not legally in this country? Why would you withhold that information, say, from a three or four or five-year-old and let them think that they were an American? Yeah. Because they do. <laughs> they are not good at keeping secrets, right? <laughs> and you have to protect your family. So if you tell your three-year-old we are not here legally, don't tell anyone. They're going to go tell everybody, like, guess what? It was a secret, right? And then the next thing you know, you're deported, right? So nobody tells these kids. Um, and so they grow up thinking that they're American, believing that they're American, acting like they're American, going through their lives thinking that they're part of the system. And then 
often towards the end of high school, this is often when kids find out because they're ready to go get their driver's license or they have to fill out a FAFSA so they can go to college and they go home and they say, hey, I need my social so I can fill out this paperwork and then, they're, and then they find out. And so all of a sudden their identity as an American is stripped away from them and they realize, I'm not Mexican-American, I'm Mexican. That's a really weird thing uh, to happen to somebody. It's a major shock to one's sense of identity. It derails your life plans because now, wait, how am I going to go to college? How am I going to work in my chosen field? How am I going to be a doctor or an engineer or whatever it is that I was planning to do? I can't even work. Um, it's a violent tearing away of people's understood past, uh, their belonging <coughs> present, and their imagined future. So um, part of what we're doing in this project is investigating that de-Americanization and that tearing away of identity that happens to these young people. Um, part of the reason um, that this comes up at that time point and not earlier is because of the Plyler versus Doe decision in 1982. So the Supreme Court ruled in 1982 that regardless of status, children have a constitutional right to equal access to education. So K through 12 education must be provided to all children in the United States regardless of status. Um, and so it's only when these children are graduating from high school that their parents have to reveal their status or the children have to be told because up through high school, you don't have to prove any sort of, of legal status. Um, and that came up because the people of Texas dis were trying to prevent these young people from going to, to school, or trying to charge their parents tuition to go to school. And that's, that's not the American way. Um, but the message that then is given to these youth is that they are American and that they belong. And of course one of the basic reasons for our public school education is to indoctrinate us into American politics, right? And you're taught all about America, democracy, the American dream, the Boston Tea Party, the American Revolution, the black civil rights movement, right? So in school, you learn all this stuff about the importance of participating and the power of social movements, right? You learn all that stuff. And um, because you're in school, you feel like you're a part of that American um, society. So 65,000 undocumented students are graduating from high school every year. Um, given that ability to do so because of the Plyler decision. And another, one more important thing about the Plyler decision before I move on, in their decision the justices said children should not be held responsible for the decisions of their parents. Right? That's setting up this idea that, okay, these children are here without papers, but it's not their fault. They, right, they don't choose to come to the United States. Other people, grown-ups in their lives, their parents or other grown-ups, are the ones putting them in this situation. And we have a very strong tradition in the United States of distinguishing between deserving and undeserving groups. Right? Children tend to fall on the side of deserving because Parents, right, grown-ups make decisions, but children are just put in situations. And so um, it's not their fault that they're here. And so they graduate from college, and they feel like they're American. They want to be American, um, but they're not really given those opportunities anymore. So for some time now, we've had an activist movement, the Dreamer Movement, named for the Development, Relief, and Education of Alien Minors Act which was first introduced in 2001 and has really never made it very far. It got really close in 2006, um, partly because Ted Kennedy and John McCain teamed up in a bipartisan force and then John McCain decided he wanted to be president more than he wanted to pass comprehensive immigration reform and of course if you want to win the Republican nomination you can't say that you're going to do nice things for undocumented immigrants uh, and so he actually then started saying he wouldn't vote for his own bill. So he didn't get to be president. Sorry, John. 
but uh, we also didn't get comprehensive immigration reform. And so that's the closest we've really ever gotten um, to making something happen. Part of why this isn't moving forward is um, because of a theory in political science or sociology called uh, the white racial frame. Um, this idea that um, people who aren't white aren't quite American, right? It's that um, consistent othering um, and criminalization of the Latino community that we see, the um, denying of their Americanness. And this happens for other groups as well. Um, some of you might be familiar with how this works for Asians in the United States. Um, they are consistently perceived as alien, as other. How could how could you be American? You don't look American, right? And that happens uh, to Latinos as well. Um, so there's this lovely quote here from Steve King, a Republican from Iowa, that that illustrates this white racial frame. Um, so speaking out about why he doesn't support uh, the DREAM Act or any sort of relief. He says, for everyone who's a valedictorian, there's another hundred out there that they weigh 130 pounds and they've got cows the size of cantaloupes because they're hauling 75 pounds of marijuana across the desert. Um, so just this constant um, negating of the um, value of these people and the criminalization of the entire community uh, and of course most undocumented Latino immigrants are not hauling 75 pounds of marijuana across the desert, right? They're really, that's really not what's driving undocumented immigration. They're coming here to work, um, not. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, but it's, it's these valedictorians that's often the focus of, of talk about dreamers, right? That these young people who have worked so hard in high school, they're valedictorians, they're voted most likely to succeed, they've been really good, right? They followed all the rules. And even those young people, <coughs> America is not willing to give citizenship to or a path to, to regularization of their status. It just shows how strong the white racial frame is that even those like best and brightest and shiniest uh, Latino undocumented immigrants can't find a way to get the public or Congress to give them some sort of relief. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, now I want you to go back in time, not quite all the way back to 1994, which maybe was harder for some of you than others, but just think about a couple years ago in 2012, right? Latinos were getting this very strange split message because Latino citizens were being told they were super important and powerful and very much a part of the American system because after all, they were going to pick the next president, right? That they were going to be the ones who would decide who would be the, press, uh, the next president of the United States. And meanwhile, the Obama administration is deporting undocumented immigrants like crazy, more deportations than any president before him, uh, and splitting apart Latino families and uh, really creating a strong sense of fear in the immigrant community. Um, so 2012 is when this story of this book really begins. On the one hand, we've got the Republican, is this gonna work if I click on this? No. Uh, ah, sure, it, sure. We can pull it up. You can right click. No, I'm doing something wrong. No, don't look at that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it's 2012. We gotta start with the Republicans. No, not that one yet. Go back to that one. I can just explain it if it doesn't. Matter. Yeah? Some folks claim that the reason he was doing this is because he thought if he could show Republicans that he was very seriously cracking down um, and getting and deporting people, that that would give him credibility to move for immigration reform. Right? This idea that he could show Republicans um, that he could work with them, that they would be reasonable. This was before he got elected, or after, right after. 
uh, since he's been elected, he's been in deportations have increased. And is it his policy like funding Homeland Security, or is it that other policies have been being put through by the Republicans that have just been happening under his watch? Uh, my understanding is this: this is executive branch. Okay. Yeah, this is not Congress. I don't think they can do that. Um, I'm going to test this. I don't know that this is working. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, it's not important. I, I think that's part of it. I think he's he's also um, Bush replaced all the uh, like over a hundred uh, uh, prosecutors in the Justice Department, and Obama did not. He left all those Republican prosecutors in place. I don't know why. But he did that. And uh, so, yeah, he's been over backwards, the Republicans, on a lot of levels. And that's one of them. Um, and fruitlessly, obviously. You know. Yeah. It turns out they didn't want to pass immigration reform, even if he was deporting millions of people. They just wanted to sabotage right. It's not important. Yeah. We're going to move on. So I'm going to pretend that that whole little commercial break didn't happen. And I just. Go back to this slide. Okay, so if the YouTube video thing was working, what you would see is, uh, God, what's your name? Mitt Romney, uh, <laughs> given Rick Perry this look during a Republican primary debate when Rick Perry starts, uh, Rick Perry is giving an answer to a question about giving in-state tuition to undocumented students in Texas. And he starts by saying how he's really beefed up border security and he's, you know, cares about that, but that if you don't think that these young people should be helped and, and uh, encouraged to go to college, then I don't think you have a heart. You know, these young people are the future of Texas and we get to help them go to college. And the crowd boos. You cannot win the Republican nomination if you have a heart. No, you cannot win <laughs> the Republican nomination by saying things that are kind or that humanize undocumented immigrants. You have to say that they should self-deport, which is, of course, what Mitt Romney says right during his campaign, is that we should make conditions so terrible here that undocumented immigrants choose voluntar voluntarily to lose, to leave the country. Meanwhile, the Democratic side, this should work. Oh, but there's no. <sighs> Is the plug, the sound plug plugged in? Yeah. No. Yes? Yeah. It's okay. No, it just, I'll just tell you what he said. Yes. Right. Makes no sense. Ah! Hold on, hold on. That's, that's YouTube. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. All right. <coughs> Come on, Obama. You want the volume on? No, I don't want the volume on. All right. He says, it makes no sense to expel talented young people who for all intents and purposes are Americans. They've been raised as Americans, understand themselves to be part of this country. To expel these young people who want to staff our labs or start new businesses <coughs> or defend our country simply because of the actions of their parents or because of the inaction of politicians. So he's kind of echoing the Plyler decision, saying it's not their fault and we have to uh, give some relief to these young people. So in this speech in the Rose Garden, during the summer before the election, he announces DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, where he says, if you've been here for five years, if you meet certain requirements, you've kept out of trouble, you've stayed in school, et cetera, we will give you a two-year work permit. So you can come out of the shadows and not be afraid, and for two years, you'll be able to work. So this is what's happening in 2012, right? On the one hand, Latinos are going to be picking the next president. But 
many of them are still getting deported, and it's a very scary environment. We've got Romney talking about self-deportation, and then the president announcing DACA, very obviously part of his strategy to get Latino votes for the presidential election. So my friends and I decided that we were interested in that, and we wrote this book. Um, so you can see there are my fabulous co-authors, Maria Chavez, who's at Pacific Lutheran University, and Jessica Lavariega Monforti, who's at University of Texas Pan American. And we conducted in-depth interviews with over 100 undocumented youth in four states. I was in charge of California because Menlo College is in California. Um, Maria's in Washington State, so she did the ones in Oregon and Washington, and then Jessica's in Texas, so she did Texas. All the interviews were conducted in the summer of 2012, after the president's announcement, but before the election. We did not do the interviews ourselves. We actually hired students to do them. Um, students would have more credibility, uh, obviously, because it's scary to talk to professors. Really, really scary. And also because, uh, you know, we we're going to be asked, so because we were going to be asking these young people a lot of fairly sensitive questions, we wanted to make sure they'd be comfortable. So, um, for example, in California, the young man that I hired went to Garfield High School in East LA led the student walkouts in 2006 in opposition to the Sense and Brenner bill, was very linked into the undocumented community in, South, uh, in Southern California, despite the fact that he is a citizen. His name is Joe Tafoya. He's actually a grad student at UT Austin, and he's awesome. So he did the interviews for me in California. Um, and similarly, Maria and Jessica hired students. Um, the ones who did the interviews in Oregon and Washington were actually themselves undocumented. And we used snowball sampling, so at the end of each interview, um, they'd say, so do you know anyone else who might be willing to talk to me and do one of these interviews? Um, so we asked them all kinds of questions about, like, what do you think about what's going on? What, what's it, how has it been like? You know, trying to get a sense of um, their experiences as undocumented people, uh, but very specifically about their political viewpoints and... Um, expectations about politics. Um, one of the, so, so various themes came out of those interviews. One of them was about the fear. Um, this constant fear of deportation, this uh, fear of being ripped away from your family, your school, or your friends, everything that you've ever known, especially if you've been here at such a young age, it's, is really daunting and quite terrifying. So another thing to keep in mind about undocumented youth in the United States is they can't go back to Mexico or El Salvador or wherever to visit because they won't be able to get back in. So actually, their U.S.-born siblings or other people in their communities who are here legally are more likely to have had experiences in the sending countries than they have because just like the workers who are trapped because of the very secure borders, they're trapped here. Um, and so if they've been here since they were very small children especially, they have no idea what Mexico is like. They have no idea what that home country is like. And so to, the idea that you could be deported to a country that you have no knowledge of and don't remember ever being in is very scary. Um, and yeah, so these young people experience a lot of fear. In Texas in particular, and this is not the case for the respondents in the other states, but in Texas in particular there's a fear because of the internal checkpoints. So if you're in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, if you're in McAllen, uh, where UTPA is, you can't even go north up to Dallas or Houston or something because they're going to ask you for your passport at a checkpoint on the freeway. So it's not, you can't just, you can't go south and you can't go north. Um, so people just can't get around. We're stuck in the border between Mexico and you can't go. You're stuck between the checkpoints and you can't go up north. I couldn't cross that stupid little checkpoint without risking it all. Leaving my mom, leaving my brother, leaving my dad. I was applying to University of Denton. I get in, but I could not go, and I went to Pan Am. That happened. That was the experience of a lot of the students we talked to, that they got into some, you know, their dream schools, but then they couldn't get there. Um, either they couldn't afford it, or they just physically, if they were in Texas in, particularly, in particular, couldn't get there without risking being deported, just getting to the school they got into. So they, maybe they got into 
University of Denton or some other fabulous <coughs> school and they couldn't go. And that's very uh, disappointing, obviously. You work so hard in high school, you know, get good grades, do your extracurriculars, etc., work really hard to achieve the American dream, and then you, and then you don't get to go. Um, they have a very strong sense of living in limbo, right? So we asked them about planning ahead. They said, we're living in the moment. We're living day by day. You know, we may get deported next year. We may get deported in five years. So how can you make a plan, or how can you plan your life if you don't know where you're going to be? Um, so <coughs> a lot of these uh, students that we talk, these young people that we talk to, even with DACA, meaning they could work for two years, they didn't really resolve this feeling of limbo because, A, well, what if Obama doesn't win? And then Romney's sure not going to support the DACA program. And then even if Obama wins, what happens in two years, right? I still don't know where I'm going to be. How do you make a plan, right? You probably all have plans. This is where I'm going to be in five years. This is where I'm going to be when I'm 30, you know? Like, you have it all planned out. But if you might get deported tomorrow, you have plan A and plan B and plan C. Um, and so you really can't uh, plan. <coughs> um, you really don't feel valued by your society. So here's a really good quote on that. That's when it hits you. You realize that you're in the system, but they don't really want you to contribute to it. Because you don't have that number, and you feel discouraged, thrown out, segregated, like a leftover. Um, you just really feel undervalued by society. And uh, that's a terrible feeling for a young person, right? Our young people are supposed to be full of optimism and hope and big plans. Um, and instead, uh, what we're creating in um, these young people is senses of hope and alienation, hopelessness and alienation and not belonging. Uh, in the book, we talk a lot about um, Chicana public theory, uh, sorry, Chicana political theories, um, like Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands, the feeling of straddling two countries, of, of not belonging. Um, that really comes out in a lot of the interviews, the sense of really not belonging in America, even though you've grown up here. And until just recently, you really thought you were American, but now you realize that you're not and, and that society doesn't care about you. And that's, you can imagine, right, a really horrible feeling. I think uh, part of the strength of this book is how the stories of these young people really makes it come alive, um, that this, these are real people. Uh, they're also pretty politically savvy, like they see what's going on with Obama, right? So there's, there's this great quote, we're not just chess pieces that you can just, you know, move around any way you want. We're actually human beings. We have, you know, dreams. We have aspirations. And a lot of the respondents were very aware of how <coughs> Obama's DACA program was so political. They were very cynical, right? They saw, like, this is to get the election. Why didn't he do this four years ago? Like, this is just politics, this is BS. They're very, uh, very cynical about this. Um, so, um, as, and they also um, felt very much like DACA was an attempt to kind of quiet down the, the movement and to quiet down the protesters. Like, here's a crumb. Now you guys stop protesting and having mock graduations and, and these things. Um, so they're, they're very cynical about that sort of stuff. Um, they also felt really pretty marginalized that, that they were not being listened to. So this split between the way politicians were acting towards Latino citizens and the undocumented community was really pretty uninformed, right? Because uh, as you might know, most people don't, right, there isn't like the Latino citizens all live over here and the undocumented population lives over here. Actually, often they live in the same house, right? Um, so here's a graphic from a Latino Decisions <coughs> poll that illustrates this. Most Latinos know somebody who's undocumented and often it's somebody who's a close friend or a family member. So it's not that there's citizens over here and undocumented over here, right? They are integrated groups. And so you can't reach out to Latino citizens 
and expect them to vote for you while at the same time you're deporting their kid or their dad or their cousin or their best friend, right? Um, that there seems to be um, blinders on, on politicians that they think that somehow these things are disconnected. And there's a lot of really good Latino decisions polling that shows that this is the like necessary but not sufficient way to win Latino support. Even if you're saying all kinds of other things that Latinos want to hear <coughs> about education and opportunity and the American dream, you know, whatever, if you're opposed to any kind of immigration reform and there's no movement, they're not going to vote for you, right? And that's, of course, what we saw in 2014, where everyone just, all the Latinos basically stayed home. It's like, fine, I'm not voting for any of you because there's no movement on immigration reform. There's no support uh, for these uh, friends and families. All right, so here's the graduate thinking about how the doors opened to the American dream by DACA, right? Okay, well, what did they think of DACA, right? So this is right after it's been announced, <coughs> but before the election, and we're asked, so it hasn't really happened yet. What did these uh, dreamers think of DACA? Some people were very positive, right? So this one woman uh, says, it's, this is um, for the best. I'm going to be able to study. I'm going to be able to give a better life to my child that I didn't have. It's going to change my life completely. Just really optimistic and hopeful, like, this is awesome. Uh, this is not how most people responded. Most people are a little more cynical than that, but we did get the occasional person who was just like, this is huge. This is such a big deal, right? Because, you know, for the first time, they're going to be able to leave the house without <coughs> fear. And that was a big deal. You can imagine, especially have, if you have a daughter, you'd like to be able to leave the house without, uh, without that fear. Um, but it was also um, more the sense of being acknowledged. So this guy says, before I was, you know, I didn't exist. I didn't have a number. So you're, you're a shadow, you know? But now I'm going to exist. You know, there's going to be a record of me. I'm going to have, like, an identification. I'm going to have a number. Uh, and we had a, a lot of people saying things like this, like this idea that finally they were being acknowledged, that they existed, that they were human beings, um, that somehow um, just getting that, that work permit card it meant, it meant so much to people. It was really quite um, striking. We also had a number of people who were very cynical about this um, and who expressed uh, various senses of fear. Uh, it's a gamble we're taking. We're already letting the system know. Here, so this gets at what you were asking. Uh, we're pretty much asked to be in limbo for two years, and then at the end of those two years, we might be at their mercy, and they can ask for another two years. At the end of the day, it's politics, and we're at the mercy of congressmen. So uh, there was a lot of concern among many undocumented youth that they were going to apply for DACA by proving they had been here illegally, providing all kinds of documentation. Here's where I live. Here's my work information, here's my parents. Are, and what if they then got deported? Because they basically just come out of the shadows and said, hi, I'm over here. So there's a lot of uncertainty and fear. Um, a lot of students were worried maybe they shouldn't do it, even though it seemed like a really good idea, but maybe wait until after the election, make sure Obama wins before submitting the paperwork. Um, and then what was <coughs> going to happen after two years? And again, now they know who you are. And you're not hiding anymore. And what if two years later they say, you know, that was a bad idea. Let's just deport them. Now they're going to know where you are. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, cynicism and distrust. But of course, for many people, it still seemed like a good idea because like, they've been waiting to go work. They want to, to do the thing they went to college for that they you know, have been planning all these years. And maybe they're stuck working in fast food or doing childcare. Being, being a nanny, right? But really, they want to be a marine biologist or a nurse or whatever, and they can't. Well, finally, for two years, they'd be able to do what they want to do. That's pretty appealing to finally be able to do that. Um, so here's a, uh, this guy has a really good story. So he um, is a, a whiz in high school. Uh, so he, Hugo came to the United States when he was 
uh, very small. He came when he was a kindergartner. He's an honor roll student in high school. He was a star football player. And he got into like every school he applied to, right? He finds out as he's applying to college that he's undocumented. He's been in the country for, you know, all these years, but his parents didn't tell him. Um, but so he gets into all these schools and into every school, but none of the schools give me any scholarships. I didn't get anything. They said, congratulations, you've been accepted. But I knew, like, I couldn't afford it. And you can't get financial aid if you don't have a social security number. Um, you can't get... Um, you can't get federal financial aid. So he went to Cal State Los Angeles, because Cal State's are much more affordable. Graduated in only two and a half years. Um, and then got a job as a waiter, because he didn't have documentation. So we asked him, like, okay, wow, after all that, so now what's, what are you gonna do now with DACA? Right? How is it gonna change your life? And he said, oh man, you know what's going to change? I'm actually gonna be able to apply for a work permit. And when I get a work permit, I'm going to go straight to the DMV and apply for my driver's license. So first he thinks immediately, like, I can finally do that stuff I studied in college instead of working as a waiter, which is not, was not my plan. Then he's going to get a driver's license, which of course is a big deal. But the real impact is in the, that last part, get my driver's license. I feel like a part of my life is going to be real, you know. He's going to exist. It's kind of like that previous comment, like, I'm going to exist, I'm going to have a driver's license. Like, I'm really here. I'm really a human. Um, and so all that stuff about, you know, having to go to Cal State LA and working for years as a waiter and just waiting wasn't really about that. The thing about the work permit goes pretty quickly out of the conversation and he starts talking about this thing of being real. Um, so this is another kind of unexpected theme of of the interviews that we pull out in our analysis is this identity stuff. This like this idea that uh, when they learn their undocumented status as teenagers uh, towards the end of high school, that um, their plans and their identities begin to unravel. So their lived lives, they've lived as Americans, they've lived with this identity as an American, doesn't match their legal identity. Um, that, in fact, they are not Americans and they have, uh, th it's a, it's a, very strange thing to happen, right? And meanwhile, their peers that they went to high school with, or maybe their younger siblings who were born here, are moving ahead, and they're stuck. Um, they are what we, uh, we're borrowing um, a phrase, uh, they're de-Americanized, right? Their American identities are stripped away from them. Um, and so, we explore with, the interview data, what it's like to be de-Americanized, to have your identity as an American uh, stripped away from you, and um, how it is to have your legal and lived identity suddenly pulled apart like this. Um, so Daniel came to the United States when he was 10. When we talked to him, he was 20. He says, from what I was to now, like I'm not that person anymore, like I'm an American. I feel like I'm an American and that I have every right that an American has, but just because I wasn't born in this country, like, you know, I don't deserve that. Like, all these years I've been trying to be like an American as much as I could be. He came when he was 10, so he knew that he was crossing. And yet he thought, well, if I just act really American, then I get to be American. Um, but of course that's not how it works. <laughs> um, and it feels really unfair that if you try so hard to be American and you learn English and you, you act American, why is it that that is not, um, why is it that that's not allowed? Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, so this woman came to the United States as an infant and didn't find out that she was undocumented until she was 17. So when we spoke to her, she was 21. Uh, but still, you can see the stickiness of her American identity. She says, I think I'm Mexican. So we asked her, you know, how do you think of yourself? I think I'm Mexican. You know, I don't know. I'm like, because I'm not even like, you know, my parents are here. I guess people are considered to be Mexican-American, either because they're born here and their parents are Mexican, or if your parents were born here and you, I don't know, because I do feel myself as American, but then I do love being Mexican because I was born here and I kind of, I kind of feel this is my home. And Joe's like, born here? I mean, I'm not, not born here, but you know, like, I feel like I was born here. 
right? And that's the thing, especially for the ones who come here so young. They feel like they were born here. They have grown up their whole lives thinking that they were born here, that they're American. And even four years later, so she's known for four years that she wasn't born here, but still, she still feels American. That identity as an American is very sticky. And she, her lived identity is stronger than her legal identity. Um, here's another long quote. Sorry, some of these are kind of long. Uh, I was, so he finds out and says, I was so uncomfortable with my immigration status. I was really ashamed. I didn't get an ID, my matricula, until my second year of college because I was just like, I don't want to force a Mexican identity. I was very resistant. Right? So he's just not accepting the fact that he's Mexican. That doesn't feel right. He, you know, came here as a small child. He's American. <coughs> and then I turned 18 and I wanted to go out. And I was like, I guess I need an ID with my age in it, too. So I forced myself to get one. And that was the first thing, I think. I was like, for a while, I kind of like questioned it, what the resistance was. Like me having been like ashamed of my Mexican identity. Or was it because I was just resisting my status and the fact that I had never lived there before? And so I was trying to be critical of that feeling. Like I had to question, like, do I have a sense of shame for who I am? Um, so again, this tearing apart of the lived identity and the legal identity really causes crises of identity and um, a sense of self in these young people. Um, and so um, he, he struggled, Mauricio struggled with his identity for a long time. Now if you ask him how he identifies, he says Latino. But it took him a long time to come up with a word that felt ex right to him and that he wasn't being ashamed <coughs> or being um, untruthful. Um, so a lot of what this is about is contesting citizenship. So maybe some of you saw um, Juan Antonio Antonio Vargas on the cover of Time Magazine talking about being undocumented um, and really challenging our existing definitions of citizenship. Um, so because right now, citizenship is only available to you if you are born here or if you, you know, immigrate, follow the rules, whatever, take the citizenship test. Um, but in countries with significant ethno-racial diversity like the United States, we are a country of immigrants. What ties us together um, is citizenship in the political body. Um, that's what gives people a sense of belonging. So when we exclude people from that sense of belonging, it's actually harmful to American democracy. And in the book, uh, Maria and Jessica and I argue that to be a truly healthy democracy, we have to be inclusive of all the members of the community, and we have to let these young immigrants and other undocumented immigrants be fully incorporated into the polity. We have to let their lived lives as Americans match their legal status, because otherwise, what are we saying about um, what our country is about? If it's not, right? If you're a country of immigrants, it's all about people coming here from somewhere else and saying, I'm going to be an American. I choose to be American. And yet, we've made it impossible for people to say that. Uh, we've created all these legal barriers to people saying, I am going to choose to be American. I'm, I'm in. Um, and excluding people who want to be American. Um, when, when these young people go to high school in the United States, they are learning about um, civil disobedience, they're learning about how our country values democracy and civic engagement. Um, and so it's really not that surprising that there's such a strong dreamer movement and strong immigration reform movement because we've politicized these young people to be undocumented and unafraid and to go out and say, um, I, de I deserve to be treated better. Um, and not only do dreamers and other undocumented immigrants deserve to be treated better, but a truly healthy, multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy requires that we allow these people to be included and we recognize their value. Um, we in this book are focusing on these kind of shiniest, best and brightest <coughs> undocumented immigrants, but why should we not similarly value people who come here to work? Are they not also choosing to be American and being part of our system and contributing? What about the kid who doesn't do so good in high school? 
that's just not they're just not good at that sort of thing but they're gonna work really hard and they want to be American and they want to choose to stay here why isn't that person also valued as a human being and we're really trying to say that all of the people who choose to be here and who want to be American and who live as Americans should have that recognized with a change to their legal status. So that's why we wrote this book. Um, and hopefully we'll see some change pretty soon. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? <coughs> Laura? Um, thanks, Melissa. That was, um, I really <laughs> want to read your book now. Yay! Um, could you just talk a little bit more about the phrase undocumented and unafraid? And um, I'm blanking on his name, but we had a Haven Center visiting scholar here last year who was involved in the production of that volume. Ben, do you know um, who that was? What was his name? No. Gary Segura? Sorry? Gary Segura? No. No. He anyway, it, but could you just talk a little bit more about that piece of the movement and I guess to what extent do you see potential, what are, what are you observing in the political arena in, in terms of how that's impacting the conversation about immigration reform? Uh, well, I think the undocumented and unafraid <coughs> movement is doing kind of what we're doing with this book, which is trying to say, this is who you're talking about. It's just not this vague phrase or your imagined image of an undocumented immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's this person right in front of you. Um, and that's much more compelling. Mm -hmm. um, and to have these young people stand up and give testimony mm -hmm. and talk about their lives really humanizes the issue. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, if we're just talking about them and we don't know any of them, and it's mm -hmm. just this weird thing that we make assumptions about and have stereotypes about, I don't think it's as compelling, right? Mm -hmm. And it's harder to deny their existence and deny their humanity when it's a person right there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really strong movement. It's really not, um, most of the people we interviewed were not able to do that. Only the Californians mm -hmm. use that phrase and, I mean, in Texas in particular, in the Rio Grande Valley, they are undocumented and afraid, very afraid. Right? And in the Pacific Northwest, there's nothing happening. Yeah. They are in their rooms on their internet being undocumented, but they're not like telling anybody. Mm -hmm. It's really only in California where's, where there's enough of them um, and a feeling of, of support and safety. Mm -hmm. So to a certain extent, I mean, really, it's, it's a little bit um, deceptive because you can only be <coughs> undocumented and unafraid if you're in the, the right context, the right environment. Where you can do that, and you know, if you're, in L if you're in LA or if you're in Chicago, and the support's going to be there to protect you and to fight for you, but in many parts of the country, you can't do that. You will just get deported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm wondering so the immigration laws have like been like a pendulum, you know, ever since the 1900s, going back and forth, but really for a long time in the United States, there was this very benevolent attitude toward immigrants. So like in the 1950s, um, we went and got Korean, uh, biracial Korean kids from the Korean War, and we brought them to the United States. Um, refugees, we, you know, you have a horrible experience with a war in your country, and we open our doors to you. What do you think are some of the reasons right now that make people so not wanting to take this humanitarian approach that you're hoping your book will will encourage them to do. I think it's, it goes back to that idea of, of deserving and undeserving. Uh, whose fault is it? Um, and so um, for, I think for the undocumented population in the United States, uh, many people don't recognize the structural <laughs> conditions that generate undocumented immigration. The idea that the reason your hotel room is so cheap and that your groceries are so cheap is because of this um, availability of undocumented labor to support our economy. Mm -hmm. So um, they put all of the blame on the choice of people to come here and work illegally and then bring their children. Whereas if you're talking about refugees or 
um, maybe people who have suffered from an international crisis, man-made or, or God-made, that it's not their fault. And that, uh, you know, we're going to save them and that they deserve saving. And they haven't done anything wrong. But these people who are sneaking in and not paying, right, there's, there's not an understanding of the structure that creates the, of the push and pull factors that are creating the undocumented population. And we do talk a lot about that in the book. There's like a whole chapter about that. Um, you know, to try to explain, like, it's not, that's not what's creating the problem. It's not just individuals choosing to come here um, to steal kindergarten. It's, it's people coming here as a result of no jobs in their home country and an incentive system put in place by our foreign and domestic policies that bring undocumented workers here and keep them here. <laughs> so many hands. Yeah. Do you think that there is some elements of exclusivity involved um, in sort of from, from the political side of things? Like if you say, oh, everyone will get legal status, or let's just include everybody, then the U.S. is not necessarily sought after place anymore to go. You know, like you lose that kind of like Apple and iPads and stuff, like you make it so shiny and restri restrictive, no one wants to go there. You know, everybody wants to do it, but now if we say, oh, let's make it all inclusive, then it's less appealing. And then like also, um, if they legalize everybody, then who's gonna do the grunge work? You know, who's gonna be the bottom of <coughs> right. society? So no, absolutely, if we, if we legalize people, if we, um, stopped with this crazy border security and we figured out a way to bring everyone out of the shadows, uh, your cost of living would go up substantially because people will not do that work. I don't know if you've seen the Colbert episode where he works as a farm worker. Because the farm worker's are like, you want to do this? Come on out. So Colbert goes and does it and makes fun of it. Like, it's crappy work, right? Um, and some of the jobs that people do, there's an excellent movie called Farming Day at Farmerville. Farmingville? You know what? So town in Long Island, they did this excellent documentary about it, and they show some of the jobs that undocumented workers are coming to Long Island to do. They're terrible, horrible jobs, and you can't pay people enough to do them. But if you had to, your costs would go up. And so part of the reason that we continue to have this issue of undocumented immigration is because nobody wants that, right? Democrats and Republicans, nobody wants all of our prices to go up, um, and that's why we're not getting more strict enforcement of the rules that are already allegedly in place. Um, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes um, pressure to not do raids, to not do ID checks, to not actually make sure that people are working legally because that would have horrible economic effects. And actually our, con our economy benefits more broadly from undocumented immigrants. And think about it, they pay sales taxes because if they go to the store and buy something, they still have to pay sales tax. They still pay property tax, uh, probably through rent, but their money is going to property taxes. They're probably still paying unemployment and social security taxes, especially if they have false documents, but then they can never file for benefits. And so all that money is supporting the U.S. economy. We have no incentive, right, financially, to, to change that. Um, and it's another big question is, well, what would happen if we legalized everyone at open the border? I, that's, I don't know if it would make us less attractive, but it would certainly change the nature of America. And I think any nation has the right to maintain its identity to a certain extent. Um, but we have to find a better way to balance maintaining our sense of identity as a nation with treating people as human beings. We've got to, I don't have an answer. That, this book is not providing an answer. The book is basically, <coughs> our current policies are racist and wrong. So you guys should fix it. But I've not solved the immigration problem. I can't, can't take credit for that. Alexander? How does this contribute to the situation in Mexico? Like, if we're not only endeavoring to keep the best and brightest, but also endeavoring to keep the hard workers out of um, any of the Mexicans that come across the border, how does, how does, where does that leave Mexico? Like, what happens well, that's to Mexico? Right, that's part of what's happening. I mean, the North American Free Trade Act of 1994 is part of what created the flow of undocumented workers to the U.S. So it's 
our foreign policies are hurting Mexico and sending workers here. So yeah, that's it's having negative effects on Mexico, absolutely. And probably other countries too, yeah. Um, I said real brief, was the DACA program, was that a, um, was that an executive order or an act of Congress? That was an executive order. So do you think, Dude, how do Congress you think, isn't doing anything. Yeah, that's, well that's what I figured, because I figured nothing like that would pass. And I was yeah. just kind of wondering how you thought that affected the cynicism. I, you know, I would imagine if it was an act of Congress, people would be more well, cynical. Well, it, it made it. people more nervous, because it meant that if Romney would, won, then he could just undo it, right? And it leaves that uncertainty of, well, what if the next president isn't a Democrat? And Obama just renewed it and extended it. Um, so now more undocumented immigrants are given relief from deportation, but they're still all executive actions. And they're still very temporary, and you just don't know. Like, what if somehow, you know, Marco Rubio pulls it off? Now what's going to happen, right? Uh, or Ron Paul or one of those other fabulous candidates. Yeah. Do you know any stories of adult youth who have actually been deported and what their experiences have been like back in Mexico? No, I wonder if, if maybe somebody else is doing that project. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but no, I don't know if anyone's doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Ben? Uh, I, I wanted to get back to Lynette's uh, question about uh, about why there's there's no movement on immigration reform, but there is actually, I mean, in, in the Latino uh, Latino Choices uh, uh, polls have shown this. There's actually a majority among all groups, uh, especially among Latinos, for some type of legalization. Mm -hmm. Now, if you phrase the, the question differently, and you say, well, you know, are you in favor of amnesty? You know, just you know, saying if you're here, you get you get to be a citizen. Then that changes. But uh, but there is a majority. There's a solid majority in favor of some type of legalization, uh, which in my mind would eventually have to lead to, to citizenship. Uh, uh, but uh, but there there is a working majority there. So is it really the problem in the way that the Republican Party, into a lesser extent the Democratic Party, nominates their candidates? I mean, it's it's the hardcore that gets involved in the primaries. <coughs> And they're the ones that were, you know, booing Rick Perry, right. or anybody, anybody that said anything positive about immigrants. I mean, they were there. It's the hardcore, it's the rabid anti-immigrant crowd that participates in these primaries and eliminates any candidate that may have any sympathy, sympathy at all toward uh, toward immigrants. So, I mean, right, and that's I'm, the same thing that's happening at the congressional level in Republican districts. Those are safe Republican seats, thanks to gerrymandering, and so you got to win the Republican primary. That's what you have to worry about, which means you're catering to very diehard restrictionists in your campaign. And so most Republican candidates for Congress have no interest. Just doesn't matter what the national public opinion polls. The polls of their people, the Republicans in their safe Republican district, are very much against amnesty, regularization, any of that. And so until enough people in those districts are not Republicans or a Latino, I mean, the demographic change is coming eventually, and they're going to have to change their tune. We're seeing that already in California. So California, we lead the nation. As you can see the future in California. So there's Republican districts in California that are becoming more and more Latino, just because that's the direction the state is going. And those Republican legislators are starting to change their tune because they realize they can't keep winning those seats by being so anti-immigrant. So I think that's what's going to happen eventually, is that you know, as we see demographic change more broadly, more Republican members of Congress will see, I can't actually keep winning <coughs> if I keep saying I'm so anti-immigrant. So it's just Yeah, but as it stands now, if you're at all sympathetic to immigrants, right. you'll get a challenge in the primary. Right, yeah. so it's not, we're not there yet. It's going to take, so I have a couple, yeah, you didn't ask me anything yet. Did you still have a question in the back? Yeah, uh, about 15 years ago, I was in a dry cleaning business, and we had to, when we hired somebody, you had to fill out a W-4 mm -hmm. at first, and you had to fax it into the state. So they had an immediate record of everybody you hired. Uh, and then they had another form. The I-9 form. The I-9 form had to be you know, right. filed off. That came along a few years later. And I wonder, it, and yet, I know we had people like 
all of a sudden our best presser got deported. Mm. You know, crisis in the one one of our in our one of our best stores. And he lost his best guy because he got deported. So obviously people are filtering through the cracks. What happened with the I nine? Did it really change anything, or was it mostly cosmetic? I nine created a robust market for false documents. So it was mostly cosmetic. Yeah. What also e verified? You know, we have to, now, before it was, you could get a fake social security number and get hired. But, you know, you could use your sister's card. But now with E-Verify, which is this nationally computerized system where they're checking names, social security numbers, are you really the person who you are? I think that's created a whole other level of fear and actually a permanent obstacle um, to moving around from job to job or, you know, even applying for jobs where you fill out an application and you're not being hired under the table. Yeah. It's working really well. I mean, boy. So UW as a university got in big trouble, I think it was like 10 years ago, because we had a whole slew of custodians who were undocumented. And so they went the I-9, the E-Verify route, and it's really hard now to get a job at UW if you are not documented. Right. But I think what people don't take into consideration is that doesn't mean those folks will leave the country. No, it just right. It just means they're going to go get another job. It doesn't really solve the problem of right. undocumented immigration. It just makes their lives more unpleasant. Scary. Uh, yeah. And and more yeah. fearful. Yeah. But it, they're going to usually if you you know if you get flagged with E Verify you have maybe 90 days to fix the problem and so you can work for a little while longer and then you have to move on. Yeah. But you're not going to go back to your sending country. It just oh, you're going to yeah. move on to get another job. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we're talking about all these different forms and, um, and you mentioned a couple of people in your uh, presentation who go on into college, right? Yeah. And before you had mentioned that it's only up until high school <coughs> where they don't have right. a social security number. So how are these so in Texas and California and a few other states, they have state programs that, so for example, in California, there's AB 540, so Assembly Bill 540. So you can be an AB 540 student, and that means that you graduated from a California high school, but you're undocumented. And you are allowed to go to state school for state tuition, and you can get some financial aid from the state. And then Texas has a similar program, and that's the one Rick Perry got booed for, that in Texas they are allowing students to go in-state for in-state tuition rates um, and go to college. So it's not a lot of states, uh, but two big ones, right, California and Texas, and a, and a handful of others where they have policies in place that, again, you know, if you've stayed out of trouble, you, you were a good kid, and you graduate from a state high school, you can stay in-state. And, and go to college. But in a way, it just delays it, right? Because then you graduate from college, and now what? You still don't have a social security number. But don't they, don't they have to come out and say that you are on the community use of programs? Yeah, mm -hmm. right? And that was what I, was saying what I was saying before about I got an email from a student, and it's actually really, it's cute the way they do it now. Um, you don't come out and say I'm undocumented. You say, hey, I'm, I'm an AB 540 student. I need, I need help. Right? So you do have to out yourself, and again, you have to be careful who you out yourself to. But most schools have you know, policies in place where it's going to be kept confidential. People will only be told when they need to know so that they can help the student succeed. It doesn't get reported to the federal government. Right? Their identities are kept confidential. Um, because at the state level, we want those students to go to college and succeed. We want to help them achieve their goals, and we don't want them to get deported. So, a lot of states um, have these programs. Yeah, I'm just wondering: is there any are there any studies, or is there any evidence about the about what what students are doing in terms of? I mean, you you shared examples of people who you know they go to college and then they're work, you know he's working as a waiter. Yeah. Are there people who? Um, 
do you have a sense in the aggregate of what those trends look like in the states that do have these entry to college no. programs? Like That's what happens question. to all of those students? What happens to all those AB five? Because then you have all of these really overqualified yeah. waiters, right? Yeah. So you do. Are and there people who? One of the problems that I know comes up is so maybe you go to college and you have to work as a waiter for a few years because you're waiting. Then all DACA comes along. You apply right. for jobs. Well, you're five years out of college. Right. How come all you've ever done is be a waiter? You know, I've got this resume over here from this guy who just graduated from college. He's also undocumented, but he doesn't have that weird gap in his work history. Right. So he's going to get the job. Right. And you're already, or con you continue to be at a disadvantage because you worked as a waiter or a nanny <coughs> or whatever mm -hmm. while everyone else was getting relevant job experience. Right. So I don't know, but I don't think it's good. Well, there's, yeah. there's which is DACA is not just that you can work for two years, you know, or that you can go to college for in-state tuition. It's also a pathway to citizenship, right? No. Where you can... No. It is two years of just not getting deported. Permanent residence. Okay, so that's no. strictly that. So the alternative, and I guess it wasn't DACA, <coughs> is the military option. You go into the military and serve for, I think it's two years, and then you can apply for citizenship. And this has been a real concern uh, because military recruiters have been, been being sent out to predominantly Latino areas. We need more military because of the wars that we're involved in. And so young Latino youth are enlisting, or whatever you call it, and um, they're dying, as yeah. well as Actually, Jessica also, has another project that she's yeah. doing on that issue. Um, mm -hmm. about the poverty draft, basically, right. um, that continues in our Latino communities, and our low-income communities. And, you know, there are some also some horrible stories of people who do that, and, and then they, they die, and then they deport deported. their families. And well, they or they still, right? Yeah. But they get deported they've, deported. they've put their information out there to get their family regularized because they've served, but now they're dead, so there's no one sponsoring them anymore. And yeah, there's go. a lot of vets in Mexico who got deported. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. There's no guarantee that uh, yeah. that serving will get you citizenship. And in fact, that last because year, because if you get a ticket, it's considered a dishonorable discharge from the army, and then you get discharged dishonorably. So now you get deported. It's for it's so um, yeah. Or, or you could just die. <coughs> like it just yeah, you get <laughs> killed. It's called killed. How right? Yeah. So how is that? <laughs> that is not acceptable to me. Is like well, if you want to be a citizen, you have to be willing to die. We're going to send you to work. You managed to not get killed for two years, and we'll think about it. I mean, that's just that. Come on, can't we value them for something other than their uh, willingness to die? To do the crappy job. Yes. Yeah, that's one other thing. I looked into this issue. It's one of my papers in my educational doctorate, and you're actually required to uh, uh, take on undocumented students. The confidentiality is is actually actually legally re, you're required to to uh, it's not an option. It's not just because some states did certain things. Um, that's a national thing. But at the you are high not, school level. No, no. At the at, college, at the college level. level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At, at the high school level, you just end free at the whole thing. But that's because we have public education and we let everybody in. But at the college level, it's a little different. You've got to pay for it. And at the college level, you're not eligible for any of the student loans or programs unless you're a U.S. citizen. Right. So you have that, you have the financial problem there. And I think in Wisconsin, they don't have a program like California and Texas where they allow in-state tuition. You actually have to pay out of state tuition. Yeah. See, it's some head snot. So that's not going to work because out so, of state tuition is really you high. Have, and right, and you can't, and you cannot go. Can't get a federal loan. Cannot get any federal yeah. aid. So. It's pretty crappy. Yeah, they, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they, they, they let you in. It's confidential, but they have these other problems. They're happy to take your money. And they'll, 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 they'll take your money if you can come up with it somehow. Right. Actually, it's the DREAM Act, which was the pathway yeah. to permanent But it hasn't been approved. But it's never been yeah, passed. Exactly. Yeah.
got close in 2006, but we just can't cross the finish line. Yeah. Have you had any, um, so that was being, is being implemented currently? It, it went into effect in 2012, and then it was, Obama renewed it and extended it in November. Right. So what's, have you heard any feedback from the youth now since it's actually happening now? You know, because this was before, right, when they were right. really skeptic. So what's their view on the Obama administration now that, that right, that's the next book. We need to contact them all and get an interview. Well, we've talked about it actually, and when we were doing the interviews, we collected all that sort of information that you would do for a longitudinal study, like can we contact you again in two years? How would we find you? But it would, you know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, so we would like to follow up. I think that would be really valuable, but we haven't done it yet. Well, people's numbers change, you know, um, and they move. I think we probably would be able to recontact them. Uh, but like, I mean, Joe's now in a PhD program. He doesn't have time to do my interviews anymore. So <laughs> um, I'd have to maybe find a new grad student, grad student assistant. Can but I ask a methodological question? Yeah. Why don't, think, why don't you think you can do the interviews yourself? I mean, besides the fact that you feel like they would be more comfortable talking to a peer, but if you're, if it's a distinction between you have to stop your research because you lost your interviewer versus you now who knows a lot about this topic and are very empathetic, why don't you think you can't do it? I don't know. Students tell me I'm scary. I don't. You, mean, you, you are scary. <laughs> See? Scary. Okay. No, I. Um, I think it's easier to talk to a peer, and especially because Joe started by talking to his friends from high school. You know, like there's that sense of comfort in, in talking about some pretty hard stuff and revealing some pretty sensitive information. Maybe now that, maybe if I'm re-interviewing them so they know I already know their story, maybe it would be fine. Yeah. Uh, but I have, you know, a job and four kids, and so to fly because around the country interviewing people is probably not also methodologically feasible. Yeah, because I could actually argue the other side, which is yeah. that if you don't have a first-hand relationship with in-depth interview data, mm -hmm. that you're really not understanding it if you're just reading the transcripts, you know, that mm -hmm. you're getting from your research. Well, we actually have audio yeah, tapes. Tapes. We listen to the tapes. Well, that's really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, that's we had them transcribed, but then whenever there was a section where I was like, huh, yeah. Let me go listen to that section, right. and also just to confirm that the transcriptions were correct, which sometimes they weren't. Yeah. Uh, or people would say, this part in Spanish. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, <coughs> so we did listen to all the parts that we actually used. That's and great. Yeah, I would say You definitely great. get a different sense of it from just reading. Yeah. yeah. So we'd like skim, because th the pile's like this big. Yeah. And I'd skim through it, like, oh, let me go find that. Melissa's been very good. Uh, she's been talking for almost an hour and a half now. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, All right. Or you get the last word. Okay. Last question. Um, so this is in, is in response to like um, having, so, so these uh, immigrants do not have social security numbers. Right. right? So does, does that mean that's why they can't go go elsewhere out of the U.S.? Like they don't have a passport? You know, can they go to Canada or, you know, go somewhere else and study and, you know, immigrate there? Is that an option for them? Well, they could try to, right? Um, so they could apply to immigrate to Canada or somewhere else, but they're not legally in the U.S., and so I don't know how that would work. Like, would they have to go back to Mexico or El Salvador or wherever and then? Fly to move to Canada. I mean, I don't. And then why would they want to go? To, I mean, really, at the base of it, like, why would they want to go to Canada though? They feel like they're Americans. Why can't we just let them stay and be Americans? They like they. they that is who they are. In internally, they are. They have lived and acted <coughs> and and been. They've been very good Americans. They've worked hard, just like we told them to, right? They stayed in trouble, worked hard, got good grades made plans, act, you know, and now we're saying like, yeah, no, he can't stay, no. Uh, it's, it's wrong. <coughs> I don't think they should have to go to Canada.
That's my real answer. Why should they have to go to Canada? Let them stay here. We're getting well, thank somebody you else much. coming in this room. <laughs> I think so. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks, everyone, fun. for coming.